Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, today, I have with me Dr. Christopher French. I invited Dr. French on here um, largely because of a class that I taught roughly six months or so ago. Every October, I like to teach a class titled uh, Paranormal Philosophy. And we watched one of Dr. French's videos, um, a lecture that he gave for the Royal Institute. And so uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on, Dr. French. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Very brief introduction here. Professor French is the head of the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit in the Psychology Department at Goldsmiths University of London. He's a fellow of British Psychological Society and for the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and a patron of the British Humanist Association. He has published over 150 articles and chapters covering a wide range of topics. His main current area of research is the psychology of paranormal beliefs and anomalous experiences. His most recent book, which I will link in the description of this video, is Anomalistic Psychology, Exploring Paranormal Belief and Experience. So um, I would encourage you if you, if you haven't, uh, if you don't know who Dr. French is, uh, super interesting fellow. Uh, and I'll, I'll link the Royal Institute video definitely worth the watch. And so I've come up with, well, my students came up with a list of questions after we watched your video that they wanted to ask you. So I'm just going to jump straight into it. Uh, we have a, our first question here. I have two Avas, so I've labeled them Ava 1 and Ava 2. Uh, Ava 1 and Aria asked you, um, what got you started on researching parapsychology? Uh, what is your background in regular psychology? Okay. Um... My interest in parapsychology kind of dates back to well, childhood, really, I suppose. Um, but I, yeah, for most of my, well, for all of my life up until kind of young adulthood, I was very much a believer in the paranormal. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just based, at, you know, partly, well, mostly on just kind of this general fascination with weird stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I'd kind of, I won't say I was kind of obsessed with it, but I would read books about UFOs. I was petrified of ghosts. I totally believed in ghosts. Um, and kind of anything else that was kind of weird and wonderful. And I think certainly like a lot of teenagers, you know, that kind of thing is, is yeah. wow, this is really exciting. Um, that kind of interest, you know, and belief was actually maintained through doing a psychology degree. That didn't turn me into a skeptic, <laughs> um, at least my, not my first, uh, first degree. My, I did a PhD in a completely different area at the University of Leicester. My PhD was on um, uh, how the two halves of the brain work and using EEG and kind of totally unrelated to any of this weird stuff. And it was just during that period that someone recommended a particular book to me. Uh, it was called Parapsychology, Science or Magic. And it was by uh, James Alcock, a Canadian social psychologist. And it was the first skeptical treatment that I'd ever come across. And yes, indeed, I thought it was a great book. Um, and that just kind of opened the doors of this wonderful world of skepticism for me. Uh, and I realized that there were kind of skeptical books out there, although, you know, they were not as easy to find as the, as the pro paranormal books. Um, there were publications like the Skeptical Inquirer and, and so on and so forth. Long story short, what started off as a kind of hobby, a side interest, um, kind of just slowly grew so that I actually I started working at Goldsmiths in 1985. And I just did a couple of lectures on this stuff from now from a very skeptical perspective. Um, about 10 years later, realized that I could actually put on a whole option on um, parapsychology, pseudoscience, all these weird things that I was interested in um, and started doing a, just small little projects with maybe student projects and so on. Um, but it just it, it grew for a long time. I was actually. Um, even explicitly discouraged from getting too involved in this weird stuff, which is interesting because obviously I pretty much had the word skeptic tattooed across my forehead. <laughs> uh, but as long as I, the, 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 the deal was, as long as I kind of had, kind of carried on with some more respectable research, right. this, this other stuff would be tolerated. But eventually I got to a point where I realized it was the, it was the weird stuff that absolutely fascinated me. Um, and there are very, very good reasons why people should kind of take it more seriously, whether you're a believer or a skeptic, there's something going on there. 
Um, and, you know, I, another factor, I suppose, was that with it being such a specialist area, you know, I could either be uh, a little fish in a, in a big pond or I could kind of be somebody in this area where uh, I would actually be known for doing this. Uh, long story short, that, that then, you know, that one book I read back in the early 1980s had a huge impact on my life and pretty much determined what I do to this day and, and what I'm known for, if anything. Yeah. Great. Awesome. This next question is um, a little complicated, so I'm going to break it down into uh, a couple of different parts here. This is from uh, Owen and Ava, too. Um, the, the first part of the question, how would you define the paranormal and also paranormal psychology? That's a really, really good question, um, because a dif different people have different definitions mm -hmm. and in my view nobody has the kind of god-given right to say this is the definition um so if you ask a parapsychologist how they would define well parapsychology and therefore the study of the paranormal um they would probably have a fairly strict definition or at least most of them would um and they would limit themselves to um extrasensory perception which you can subdivide into three different uh, topics. On the one hand, you have telepathy, the alleged ability of direct mind-to-mind -mind contact. You have uh, precognition, that's having knowledge about future events with not just based on inference or available evidence, just you know, some, somehow psychically uh, before they happen. And clairvoyance, which is obtaining information from remote locations again, not using the normal sensory channels. Um, also, uh, that's the kind of sensory side of the paranormal, if you like. Also psychokinesis, the alleged ability to influence the outside world by the power of thought alone. Um, and finally, evidence relating to life after death. But that would be it. Now, the mass media and also anomalistic psychologists such as myself have a rather looser definition, which is pretty much anything weird and wonderful. So that might yeah. also include things that the parapsychologists would, would not consider. So things like um, alien abduction claims, mm -hmm. the Bermuda Triangle, astrology, you know, the, the, the list goes on, Bigfoot, whatever, you know. Um, now, I think there are good reasons for doing that in the case of uh, anomalistic psychology. Um, basically, you know, like a couple of examples I will often give, if you go for a reading with a medium, then that medium claims to be able to communicate with the spirits of the dead. So that's very much within the definition of the strict definition of parapsychology. But what you actually are told and the interaction that takes place will not be that different to what you'd get if you went to see an astrologer or a tarot card reader. And I believe that the, the, the psychology behind what's going on is essentially the same, or at least very, very similar. Um, and therefore it would kind of be very, you know, it wouldn't make much sense to kind of just consider one but not the other. I'm interested in the psychology of, of these things. Um, and so, you know, I think it makes sense. I mean, another example would be the relevance of, uh, say, false memories. Mm. For me personally, I think that um, false memories offer offers the best explanation of claims of past life memories re relating to reincarnation. That does relate to life after death, therefore within... Uh, the strict definition of parapsychology, but I also think false memories are very relevant when we're dealing with alien abduction claims, uh, which again would fall outside that strict definition. So my definition is more in line with that of the mass media, uh, just kind of anything, anything weird, I'm interested in it. Um, but it, it, the, the, the answer basically boils down to, well, it depends who you ask uh, and different people will have different ways of defining what, it, I mean, I, again, I think a nice definition of the word paranormal, which yeah, I think serves so can do a lot of work, is um, claims for phenomena which cannot be explained in terms of uh, currently accepted scientific understanding. I think that's quite a nice, concise definition. Mm. So the next aspect of this question, um, as we were kind of having um, a conversation about what the paranormal is and kind of your general approach to studying the paranormal, one of the questions that got raised was like, um, well, is this a study of or a uh, sort of a scientific approach 
maybe we can divide this into two aspects, the psychological and the uh, philosophical, right? So psychologically, would these paranormal claims also include religious claims and maybe more philosophically, um, does any of this constitute as a sort of proof for or against something like the, the big question here was questions regarding like life after death, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. if you if you demonstrate, maybe if we had some empirical evidence for life after death, that would lend sort of philosophical credence, ontological credence to the existence of something like the soul. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so um, well, dealing with the kind of the latter first, I agree entirely. Um, there is a, a, a section of, of the book you referred to where I kind of discuss just only a couple of kind of philosophical issues. It doesn't, doesn't exhaust the philosophy of, uh, of, para, of the paranormal by any means. But um, clearly any kind of evidence, empirical evidence, which relates to the possibility of life after death is also kind of directly related to the whole issue of the nature of consciousness, you know, the, the hard problem. Um, okay. Now, you know, although I find it a fascinating topic, I personally don't think that anyone has come close to actually solving that problem. Uh, I don't even think we're kind of, you know, what the shape of the answer would be kind of thing. I think, you know, there's whether we ever will or not, I do not know. Um, but clearly any evidence that does support life after death, whether we are talking about reincarnation claims, um, certain aspects, well, out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences, uh, ghosts, reincarnation, mediumship, the whole, the works, if any of that stuff could be proved to, to, to be genuine, then to my mind, it does kind of offer support for some radical form of dualism. Clearly, mm. consciousness, the soul, the mind, whatever you want to call it, can become separated from the physical substrate of the brain. Um, I personally, obviously, I'm not convinced by the evidence that's put forward. I think there are more plausible alternatives. One thing that I do, I, I'm probably going to have on my gravestone, I think, is I could be wrong. <laughs> you know, and I keep, I used to tell this to my students, um, but I think that they, the, the general tendency was to go away and, and answer exam questions as they saw it, in, in line with my prejudices, you know, that, uh, uh, no, he's, he doesn't believe any of this stuff. Well, I don't, you know, if I had to bet my house on it, I would bet against, but I could be wrong. And some of the evidence that is put forward is much stronger than some of the other evidence. I don't think the skeptics have got knocked down arguments for every single claim. Um, but as I say, I, I, I on that, I, I kind of gone from, I gone from, as I said, from being a believer to being what I now look back and think as see as kind of been a rather extreme skeptic back towards the middle ground, but still on this side of skepticism. So yeah, there, I mean, there are philosophical questions which I think are raised by this area, the, 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 the questions and the empirical evidence that's available. Um, you know, I, I find kind of Hume's arguments on, on miracles, for me personally, very compelling. Mm. Um, and so there's cer only certain kinds of evidence that I would see as being very strong, and that's evidence obtained from well-controlled experimental studies producing reliable, robust, replicable effects. And I don't think parapsychology has that yet, if it ever will. Um, anecdotal evidence is always just too problematic. There's too much, there's too much room for error. And, and you know, no matter how sincere people are, we know that they make mistakes. Um, the first part of your question, could you remind me what the first part was? Yeah, yeah no, no worries. Um, so the first part was kind of psychologically. Hmm. Um, maybe you can speak to, so the, the question itself was related to, is studying paranormal psychology, I, would this give us insight into like the nature of religious belief from a kind of a psychological standpoint? Are the two kind of closely related there? Right. Right, right. Now that's, again, really good question. Um, and again, it's something that I touch on in, in the kind of one of the opening chapters of, of the book, um, looking at certain kinds of, there are certain kinds of beliefs that we, um, we, we might consider, we might typically not think of as being paranormal claims, but actually they would fit our definition of a paranormal claim. So 
re references to miracles in the Bible and other religious works, you know, if Jesus really did turn water into wine, that's a psychokinetic effect, you know, um, and and certainly, you know, the, the the I think for a long time people, well, in the early days, uh, people tended to try and avoid religious topics, and I just don't think you can. I've given up on, on that attempt. Okay. There are certain kinds of uh, experiences that we recognise. Everybody would kind of expect to see in a book on parapsychology, like near-death experiences, that are inherently religious in nature to the person who is having the experience. They, they believe they see God or Jesus or other religious figures and so on. Um, and so I think, you know, there's, it, it's kind of very artificial to, to, to e even though a religious person might not be, feel too comfortable with the idea of miracles being de described as paranormal phenomena, they are in any in any reasonable definition. Now you can mm -hmm. also, from the psych psychological point of view, you can look at whether the underlying explanations for uh, belief in, say, uh, ghosts and other phenomena overlap with religious uh, beliefs. And and I th again, I think it's, it's pretty clear that yes, they do. And that's not to say that you know we know that our psychological explanations are the correct ones. Um, but for example, just to give you but one example, um, there's quite a lot of evidence that we have certain cognitive biases that would predispose us towards those kinds of beliefs. So when something happens in the world around us, our default assumption, at a non-conscious level, is someone or something made it happen. Now, we may override that kind of consciously, you know, we may realize that the kind of noise we can hear that is, is just a, it's just a branch blowing against the window and it's, you know, but the idea that it might be some kind of spirit or some kind of threat is also there. Um, and it makes sense in terms of our evolution. You know, we have evolved brains to keep us alive long enough to pass on our genes to the next generation. Our brains have not evolved to help us to ascertain the truth with a capital T about the way the universe is. Um, and therefore it makes sense for us to um, assume that there are potential threats out there, even on the basis of you know, ev quite shaky evidence. Uh, assume that in, you know, in earlier times, if the crops failed, well, someone or something made them fail. Maybe we've angered the gods or maybe a witch has cursed the farmer or whatever else it may be. Um, and I think that those, but to my mind, those are kind of plausible ways of, of thinking about both paranormal beliefs and traditional religious beliefs. And I think the underlying psychology is often quite similar. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and to my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, the the psychology of religious beliefs is something that's a kind of an established branch of psycho psychological studies, right? It's interesting. So the next question, uh, a little bit more lighthearted, but interesting nonetheless. Uh, this is asked by Maddie and, and Maddie and Lillian. And there's also several parts to this one. Um, what is your favorite topic regarding the paranormal? It's a good question. I mean, I find it all fascinating, to be honest. I find it hard to, um, to actually kind of select any particular one. Um, I mean, when I first got into this area, um, I kind of realized that there didn't seem to be very much on ghosts. But that seems to have changed over the years. And uh, certainly, you know, these days I could kind of talk for hours about the psychology of belief in ghosts and spirits and how Ouija boards work and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, but no, I wouldn't like, to be honest, I really wouldn't like to just to kind of select out one particular topic. I mean, I'm, I find... Um, kind of alien abduction claims i find that an absolutely mm. fascinating area i suppose maybe the, maybe the best way for me to answer it is to say what what topics what areas seem to have kind of predominated in terms of the actual research that we have done in in recent years and that does seem to kind of fall into three areas it, it, in my mind they kind of they're related to each other one is um, the phenomenon of sleep paralysis. I don't know how many of your mm. students are familiar with that. I'm sure that some of yeah. them have had it. Um, but sleep paralysis is a, is a fairly common experience in its more basic form. It's when you're half awake, half asleep, and you realise that you can't move. 
Um, and that in itself can be a bit disconcerting, but it can also be associated with other symptoms like uh, an extremely strong sense of presence. Mm. Even if you can't see anything or feel any, hear anything, you feel as if there's something in the room with you and also hallucinatory experiences. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, certainly kind of ghostly claims of ghostly encounters or demonic encounters can be explained in terms of sleep paralysis. It also plays a role with respect to alien abduction claims. Um, the other big factor to my mind in alien abduction claims is false memories, because very often hypnotic regression is used on the assumption that the aliens have wiped the person's memory for the whole abduction experience. There's just a few telltale clues left, right. which are basically symptoms of sleep paralysis. Um, and then the person goes to hypnotic regression and ends up with a full blown narrative detailed images of, of having been abducted by aliens now again that's an area in both of those cases although i got into them because i'm interested in the kind of interest in the weird stuff they're interesting topics in their own right and certainly with respect to uh, false memories obviously that's a topic that has huge implications for the legal system um for reports of um you know people claiming that they've re that they've uncovered repressed memories in therapy of being the victims of abuse and so on and so forth so you know, hugely important topics in their own own right um and then i suppose the final one so it's kind of as i say sleep paralysis false memories and the psychology of belief in conspiracies is is something yeah. that's really, uh, become it, i mean you don't have to go back that many years and there's hardly anybody doing research in that area and now for understandable reasons it's a very very hot topic and you know, during the COVID pandemic, people lose their lives because of their beliefs in these unfounded conspiracy theories. So things don't get much more important than that. Right. So, and I don't know if this has been your experience, the, the kind of follow-up question here. Uh, when, I, when I taught my uh, philosophy of the paranormal, the, I found the reason why most people signed up for it was because they had had some sort of paranormal experience and that they were looking to to kind of justify this. So the, the follow-up question is, have you ever experienced anything paranormal? And what would your response be to somebody who, who might come to you interested in explaining their own paranormal experience, assuming that because you've researched it, you might have the answers there? Right. I've certainly had experiences which if I were a believer in the paranormal, I would have interpreted in paranormal terms. But now I find these other um, explanations more plausible. Mm -hmm. So just, just to give you one example, um, I remember uh, when I was just after, be between doing my undergraduate degree and my postgraduate degree, I worked as a kind of research assistant for a year. Uh, and during that year, I had one experience of waking up in the night and seeing at the foot of my bed, my standing there my girlfriend of the, of the time who I knew was about four hours away on the train you know and I kind of rubbed my eyes and she'd gone but you know I, I could not but help uh giving her a call later that evening that, that day and saying we, we, you know were you okay last night <laughs> absolutely fine but you know it's the kind of thing which obviously one could have uh, interpreted in, uh, as being some kind of paranormal phenomenon um there's, there's nothing, I mean, given that these days I've actually spent a lot of time in supposedly haunted locations. I've kind of, you know, played, played the resident skeptic on TV series of investigating haunted homes. And I've been kind of locked in rooms and basements and attics, which are supposedly haunted. And you might think, particularly given how scared I was of ghosts as a kid, and I'm not a brave man even now, but no, I was terrified. <laughs> Uh, but these, it's about as exciting as watching paint dry. You know, it really, it's just, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm there kind of in the dark, you know, being filmed with a night camera and kind of thinking, why, why, why am I doing this? I used to have a problem. <laughs> uh, oh, I know why I'm doing it. It's because they pay me. That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> but no, uh, I've never, no, not, never seen anything kind of, um, kind of, kind of weird there. There have been a couple, one question that people often ask is, you know, have you been able to explain every single you know mm. claim well no you i couldn't possibly claim to do that you know often the evidence just isn't there you know we can't rerun the events we don't know what really happened so on and so forth there are a couple of um 
instances during kind of TV programs uh, that I've been involved in, where certainly I've ended up kind of thinking, oh, well, that, that, that was interesting. You know, it's not, it's not persuaded me, but I put that in a kind of mental box with a question mark on the top saying, I'm, I'm not sure what was going on there. Um, but overall, no, I've not. I've not, I've not found anything yet to kind of shake my scepticism. I mean, I'm currently engaged in a study uh, with a parapsychologist uh, and a chap, a chap got in touch with me because he was, uh, he knew I was interested in this sort of stuff. He's a lucid dreamer. He's one of these people who is aware of when he's dreaming. And he actually is an artist. He uses it as part of his art. He will get commissions from people where he will go to sleep have a lucid dream. In his dream, he will remember that he's supposed to produce an artwork. He'll produce it in the dream, and then he wakes up in the morning and he produces it in reality. It's a three oh, wow. you know, nice <laughs> USB. Um, but I'm collaborating with him and a parapsychologist to see whether lucid dreams might possibly foretell the future. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not expecting us to get positive <laughs> results. She, she certainly is the, the parapsychologist involved and he doesn't know, you know, he's just intrigued and wants to find out. So maybe if you come back in six months, I'll have solid evidence that uh, precognition is a real thing. But <laughs> at the moment, no, I'm not convinced. I'll be sure to check back in with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other part to that would be, you know, and not all psychology relates to therapy or interpersonal conversations or stuff like that. But, you know, if you have somebody that uh, approaches you and you're having this, they ask oh, you yeah. kind of what you do for a living and they say, well, I've, you know, I saw a, a, a spirit when I was younger or I'm, I'm a psychic or something like that. How would you approach that? Like, well, I have these personal convictions. I tend not, I mean, it depends on, on how the person feels about the situation. Um, I mean, and that ranges from, uh, I'll sometimes get emails from people. I mean, I'm not a clinical psychologist. So that's the first thing, to say, you know, so I, I don't kind of deal with people's trauma. I've not got the skills, uh, the expertise to do that. I will occasionally get uh, emails from people who describe what's happened to them. And if it sounds to me like um, it's almost certainly a, the, the case that they are suffering from sleep paralysis. Well, I feel I can help that person. I can tell them about sleep paralysis. I can say, you know, look, I, I know how terrifying it can be, but it's essentially harmless. And I kind of really, you know, I really want to get that message across because just by reassuring them, that they're not the only person in the world who is suffering in that way. Um, being able to kind of send them, you know, chapters and papers and so on so they can read about it. Sometimes that's enough in itself to calm them down and then they sleep better and then they don't have sleep paralysis. So, you know, so that, that's kind of, that can kind of be quite nice. But I also get sent things, get, get sent emails occasionally from people who, to my mind, probably have more serious uh, mental issues and I've not got the expertise to deal with those so i'll try and refer them on it is a it is an issue because what do i i don't on the one hand i don't think it'd be very helpful for me to say oh don't be silly you know that's there's, there's no such thing as the paranormal so dismiss their their experiences and usually you're not doubting the experience it's the interpretation of the experience that's the that's a that's the tissue um but i don't want to send them into the arms of somebody who'll tell them it's all real that they are being attacked by demons or whatever um i so saw i, I that there are one or two psychology, clinical psychologists who basically would take the, that situation and say, well, regardless of whether it's real or not, it's causing you distress. Let's try and deal with the emotional distress that's being caused. And I think that's the, that's the kind of best approach to take. Mm -hmm. um, on at other times, if someone is quite happy there with their paranormal belief, I won't particularly try and persuade them that I think they're wrong if they ask for my honest opinion I'll give it um you know and, and I can certainly in, in in the past I'd often find myself in the kind of uh appearing on daytime tv shows with audiences full of you know little old ladies who'd lost a, a, a loved one I don't want to convince them that no they're not really in touch with Albert you know they're getting comfort from that that's absolutely fine by me um then and then there is the other side to it of the kind of consumer protection type thing I'll make a huge distinction in my mind and, and in the way that I interact with people. If I know someone 
is if or rather if i believe that someone is is kind of sincere that they they really have some kind of gift they can talk to the dead and they don't seem to be exploiting you know cynically exploiting vulnerable people well yeah i think that's a very different kind of moral position uh, than somebody who i know is a con artist if i know someone's a con artist i'll go in guns blazing and mm. try and expose them um you know and uh, I've, I've kind of you know done that on more than one occasion um but the vast majority of people who claim to have these gifts in my opinion and that's all it is are sincere they really do believe they have i think in some cases in the case of mediums they really are hearing voices it's just that it's not the voices of the dead they, they've basically got mild symptoms there's a concept within clinical psychology of what's called schizotypy it's basically the idea that rather than thinking in terms of oh these people over here have some kind of serious psychopathology and the rest of us are fine it's a continuum so some people never have a weird experience in their life some people have them more or less 24 7 and maybe extremely distressed by them and need professional help but a lot of us are somewhere else on the continuum we might have the occasional situation where we think we hear someone shout our name or mm. we, we think we see something in the corner that's not really there um now i think with the case of some mediums there are some that we know are deliberate fraudsters you know there are there are techniques that you can practice to pass yourself off at that um but also there are uh, there's kind of quite good evidence that often these people really are hearing voices. They score more highly on this measure of schizotypy, as it's called. But rather than being distressed by it, they've decided it's a gift. It's uh, you know it's a, it's a it's a positive thing. And to my mind, if provided they're not actually doing any harm, I'd kind of feel inclined to you know. <laughs> leave them alone i'm not i think when you when i first became a skeptic there's almost a kind of um you always feel as if you're on a campaign to to mm. uh, get rid of these views stamp them out they're all evil but i mean actually the fact a lot of paranormal beliefs probably provide comfort to people so why not take that away as a scientist i'm more interested in what's true than what makes us feel good but no i don't impose that on anybody else it's and if they're not if you're not doing any harm fine you can believe what you like hmm. so returning to a, a to the sort of comment you made earlier when you said you may have experienced something that you mentally put in a separate category with the question mark the the last part of this question moving from have you ever experienced anything paranormal yourself is the question of do you think so we have this paranormal psychology regular psychology the question is could the paranormal ever become the normal oh yeah no it's a, that's a yeah. really excellent question as well yeah um i mean that that, that is a kind of that, that's one of those kind of interesting kind of philosophical points that parapsychology because it's essentially defined in negative terms that which cannot be explained by conventional science could in principle uh, if it was very successful, kind of um, be defined out of existence. So just to give you one kind of example, again, this was one from Jim Alcock's book of all those years ago. Uh, he talks about when kind of people were first investigating how bats navigated. And because they didn't know about sonar at the time, it was speculated that maybe it was some kind of psychic ability. But of course, once, once it was realized, oh no, it's this kind of echolocation, very sophisticated echolocation that they're using, um, then that was no longer considered to be a paranormal thing. Well, supposing we got to a point where we could prove that yes, under certain circumstances, people really could directly transmit information from one mind to another. Well, the next step would be, well, to figure out the mechanism of how that works, um, understand it in the same way that we're trying to understand any other part of the natural world, in which case, does it remain as a paranormal phenomenon? It's not beyond conventional scientific explanation anymore. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, I, you know, if, if the question really kind of ultimately boils down to kind of a set of sub questions, like, is there really such a thing as telepathy, you know? Um, I think before we try and come up with explanations for things, I want to be sure that there is actually something there to be explained first. Um, right. I mean, the, the one thing about anomalistic psychology, I think, which um, is 
that if nobody is trying to come up with non-paranormal explanations for ostensibly paranormal experiences, then clearly we, we're not going to come up with them. Um, and, and to my mind as well, it's much better to be able to produce empirical evidence collected under con properly controlled conditions to demonstrate things like the power of suggestion and the way that we can manipulate people's memories of what they think they've seen and so on and so forth, rather than just saying, oh, well, it's probably a false memory or, uh, oh, well, you know, you, you, it was because, you know, the, the, it's the power of suggestion, actually demonstrate it. And we can do that quite reliably. And we can show that perception, um, memory, and a lot of other cognitive processes are very much influenced by what's going on around you and also your own prior beliefs. Mm. And the, the last part of that question is, do you currently based off of the phenomena that you have studied, is there a candidate, what's the strongest candidate do you think that might one day be explained scientifically? Uh, Right. Well, again, we're getting back to, I mean, I think to my mind, if it's explained scientifically, then it's not part of the parapsychology anyway. Um, so uh, I, I think I'd probably maybe turn that question around and say, what would I see as being the biggest challenges to skeptics such as myself? You know, what are the, what are the, oh, that's, that's my dog. It's not a There's great your dog. dog. <laughs> um, there, I, I, obviously, I don't. I'm not overall convinced by any of the evidence that is, that is currently being put forward. Uh, what happens in parapsychology is you seem to get a pattern of a kind of series of false dawns. Um, you know, the, the holy grail for parapsychology is to come up with a reliable, replicable, robust paranormal effect. It doesn't have to be a hundred percent replicable we don't get that in psychology so we don't expect it in parapsychology but it has to be reasonably replicable now some parapsychologists would argue that they've already got that um i think the vast majority would say well no we don't we haven't but the evidence is suggestive enough to merit further research and, and i've got a lot of sympathy with that um there are areas like um the so-called gansfeld effect Gansfeld is a particular technique for studying telepathy. The idea is that if telepathy does exist, it may well be, on normal circumstances, a very weak signal that's often drowned out by a lot of background noise. So if you can dampen down the background noise, you might be able to pick up on the signal. So this is the, the thing where you get people, you get a sender, a telepathic sender in a remote location who uh, looks at a particular target, they used to use like one, they used to use kind of ran sets, randomly selected sets of images, postcards. And then from that set of four, one would be randomly selected and the person would look at that and they transcend that information to a receiver. And it's the receiver who is in this kind of state of um, uh, perceptual deprivation. So, so they'd have earphones on with white noise, they'd be lying on a comfortable couch, They'd have ping pong balls over their eyes with cotton wool around them and just, you know, a, a red light bulb, the good old student's favourite, the red light bulb, so that if they open their eyes, all they see is red. Mm. And if you try it, it's, it's very relaxing, you know, and you find that you go into this kind of state and your mind fills with imagery and so on. And the idea is maybe that's a psych conducive state. Now, you can basically... At prearranged times, you get the sender to try and send some kind of an image. People tend to use video clips these days, you know, they're more dynamic and there's more action and so on. Um, person just describes what's going on in their mind. And then at the end of the session, uh, either the receiver or independent judges can compare the what was going through the person's mind, the, the transcript, with the, the four possible targets. You'd expect them to get a match one in every four times just by chance, but the claim was that it was typically kind of often one in three, you know, not a massive difference, but a statistically significant one. Um, without going into the whole long history and the current status, I think that is uh, that's a technique that certainly 
for a long time looked the most promising. Overall, on balance, as I say, I think that the, posit the apparently positive results that have been produced may be better explained in other terms. Um, again, without wanting to go into the full details of this, because it's a huge topic in itself, there's been a big issue within psychology around rep within psychology now I'm talking about mainstream psychology called the replicability crisis I don't know if you've not been familiar with that um, and the idea is again without going into too much detail that it was kind of it was realized that a lot of the effects which psychologists had taken as being kind of standard established effect reported in the main textbooks for years may not actually be real um, and this is a big worry, obviously, it kind of casts puts a big question mark over the whole of the whole discipline. And the, one of the questions that arises, well, what, how are these positive results cropping up in the first place? And rather than it being that there's kind of widespread, massive, deliberate fraud, it's much more insidious than that. It's the fact that whenever you run a study, you have various decision points where you can uh, analyze your data this way or that way, or you maybe, you maybe you'll statistically transform your data, or maybe you'll rule out outliers, or maybe you'll have a look at your data when you've collected 80 participants' data and something's nearly there. So you'll run another 20, see if it comes out then. You know, there's all these little things. Often those decisions are not reflected in the final report. It all sounds very plausible and very as if, yes, we, we started out, we were going to do it this way from the beginning, and that's what we did, and that's what we found, you know. And now it's recognised to a much greater extent than it perhaps was before that all these little decisions can have a cumulative effect that means that the rate of spuriously significant effects that are reported, because there's a great pressure on everybody to publish, is much higher than we once realised. Now... That is a big worry for psychology. Psychology is putting its house in order. Um, it's got, uh, you know, the, the, you know, these days there's a much greater willingness to publish negative findings, which are just as important as positive findings. But of course, right. you, you don't even think they're worth writing up. You know, why would you bother? You're never going to get into a good journal. You know, you've got other things you can do. Um, so that, there's a big move to change that. There's a big move towards pre-registration where you say in advance what you're going to do in, in very great detail down to the level of what analyses you're going to do and so on and so forth. Um, and this is all really healthy, I think. I think it's a really good thing. But the implications for parapsychology are that those kinds of questionable research practices will, will have been going on in parapsychology as well. And, you know, all science is about trying to separate the signal from the noise. What would a science look like if it was just based on noise? I think it may well look like parapsychology. Mm. Mm. The, the last question here is, is kind of related to what you were just talking about with the, the problem of replication. Uh, this question is asked by Issa and Lillian, and this is the question, um, if you're going into this as a skeptic, if you're going to study, um, I think we watched a video uh, of the study that you did on the uh, dowsing rods. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the question was like, if you're going into this as a skeptic, how do you prevent your own bias from influencing the experiment? Now, that's a great question. I mean, within, within parapsychology, well, and, and maybe even beyond that, within psychology, there is a there's a tendency for people who believe that they're going to get an effect to be more likely to get one. People who don't believe to be less likely. Um, now, those kinds of things can, in principle, be ruled out by you by the use of double blind techniques. Now, I mean, for one thing, when we test any kind of paranormal claim, we devise that test in collaboration with the claimant. You know, there's no point in designing a test that at the end of the day, the claimant can turn around and say, well, I never said I could do that anyway under those conditions, you know. So we will bend over backwards providing it doesn't compromise experimental design to, to meet any reasonable requests. And we'll make, and we get them to sign something in advance saying, this is a fair test of my claim. We always do that, you know. Um, and what always happens is, we run the test, they fail the test, and then they decide it wasn't a fair test after all. Um, now, um, within parapsychology, there is actually a notion that it's, it's what's called the sheep-goat effect. 
the sheep, sheep within parapsychology, sheep are the believers, goats are the skeptics. Um, and this sheep goat effect can operate uh, in various different ways. It can operate, it, the parapsychologist would claim, at the level of the individual participants taking part. So that if I ran an experiment on telepathy on a large group of students, they would say that, that they'd be more likely to get pos significant positive results supporting the existence of telepathy from those students who believe in telepathy rather than from the skeptical students, but also at the level of experimenters. So they believe that the experimenters own beliefs and attitudes can directly affect the results. Now, this is, you know, on the one hand, this is a problem. If, if, if it was a, a genuine paranormal effect in itself, it means that I am ultimately doomed to never get significant positive results. You know, I have to decide whether I'm going to accept the results reported by these other believers over here, but I'll never see them with my own eyes. And certainly, whenever I try and replicate their effects, I don't get those results. I think, having thought about this, there's a much more simple explanation. And that simple explanation is, in terms of getting back to the old questionable research practices, um, if I run an experiment on some cl claim of telepathy and so on, I decide in advance how I'm going to run it. I'll do it, try and do it as fairly as I can, double blind, so that I, you know, I can have no direct impact on the results and so on. Then I will analyze the results and the results almost certainly will come out as not significant, you know, and I'll stop. That's it. Fine. That's why I expected to happen. That's what I've got. I've made my point. If I was doing a similar kind of experiment but on a non-paranormal topic, I might be then tempted to engage in some of those questionable research practices without realizing that I'm committing any big crime, you know, and I can think back to my own research career and realize I have done this in the past without realizing it was anything really terrible, but you'd run an experiment and you, know, you didn't get this effect that you were pretty confident would come out. Oh, but then again, you know, if I actually, if I look at the data now, I'll go back and look at the raw data, which I wouldn't have bothered if I got the effect I wanted. I'd have just stopped then, you know, um, mm -hmm. but I haven't. So I'll have a look at the data and think, oh, well, oh, do I need to transform that statistically? Or do I need to rule out these outliers? And I'll give myself two or three more bites of the cherry, making it more likely that I can torture the data until it confesses, you know? Um, and so I think that's what explains the, the sheep goat effect. The, the believers are much more likely to engage in that kind of because they because they really believe that the effect should be there and they sincere, you know they sincerely believe that it should be there they, they are going to find it in the same way that I might do in a non-paranormal context or might once have done you know I'd like to think that now I have I have learned my lesson at the end of my research career so I can turn around to all the young budding researchers and say do as I say do not do as I did you know I feel kind of mm. feel quite bad about that because it's making life much more difficult but the quality of the results that are going to come out from future research now we're more aware of these issues ought to be better than maybe we've had in the past interesting so the the final question is maybe if we have some young researchers that are interested in this area of psychology or maybe even lay people who just like to read about and learn about this sort of thing uh what are some resources that you would recommend there well, obviously, there's this rather wonderful textbook. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, people might, I mean, being serious, people, people, people might want to have a look at, uh, my, I mean, my website is uh, profchrisfrench.com. Um, and that's got, it needs updating as always. Um, but that's got kind of lots of papers and video clips and, and other stuff that people might be interested in. I am actually... Um, writing, I mean, I'm writing the final chapter of a popular science book on all this stuff. Um, now, I don't know whether I asked you about this. I'm gonna, can, I, can I use a slightly rude word? Because the title is, the, the title is gonna be The Science of Weird Shit. <laughs> 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 and, and it talks about all these things we talked about now, uh, plus a lot more. Um, that, that, that should be out kind of hopefully sometime later this year, uh, if not early next year. Um, and now uh, that's enough self-promotion. Let's talk about some. Uh, let, let, let's talk about some other stuff. Um, there's a there's a magazine called the Skeptical Inquirer. Um, there's also the uh, the British 
Skeptic magazine, which is now online only, but it's free. So if people check that out, there's lots of interesting articles there. Um, and there are, there are kind of basically, you know, th there are kind of a lot of resources out there. I don't know. I mean, over in this country, um, we, we have quite a lot of uh, kind of public meetings. We, we have skeptics in the pub. I don't know if you've come across uh, oh. that. Um, this is this is something that kind of started uh, quite a few. Well, yeah, decades ago. Um, it's just basically a monthly meeting in a pub where somebody comes along and does a talk and mm. then there's a QA and a and people have a drink and socialise. Um, lots of different branches of that up and down the country in the UK. But I'm sure there are similar kinds of um, mm -hmm. uh, meetups in, 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 in uh, where you are. And also there's a lot of online stuff these days, obviously, kind of yeah. partly thanks to the pandemic. So, um, you yeah, keep your ear to the ground. Um, and, yeah, there, there is stuff around there, as I say, it's, it's not as kind of obvious. It takes a bit more digging around to get to than all the pro paranormal stuff. But things are a lot, a lot better these days than they were when I was growing up. It was hard. I couldn't find any kind of I wasn't looking for any skeptical stuff. I just and I if it said it in a book, I believed it. I was very, very naive. Um, whereas now I would be kind of much, much more skeptical. I think there's a much greater awareness, of course, of um, fake news to use that overused term um but people are more aware that just because you're told something doesn't necessarily make it true sadly a lot of people still seem to have not got that message hmm. well thank you dr french I, I really appreciate you taking the time to meet with me um i learned a lot i'm sure my students were lo learned a lot i appreciate you coming on my pleasure okay you take care now okay you too